Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for standing by, and welcome to the Building and Deploying Customer Behavior Models webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in listen-only mode. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few tools you will be able to use throughout the webinar. To submit a written question at any time during the event, click the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Next, type your question into the rectangular space at the bottom and click the Send button. Please keep the Send To defaulted to all panelists. We encourage you to ask questions at any time during the presentation. Your questions will not be viewable by other members of the audience. Questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Polling questions will appear periodically throughout the event that will appear as a pop-up on the right-hand side of your event window. When the question appears, select your response, and please don't for forget to click the Submit button. Sound for today's event is being brought to you via audio broadcast, which plays sound directly to your computer speakers. If you are experiencing any challenges with the audio broadcast, close the audio broadcast dial-off box and then click on the participants icon located on the floating toolbar or on the right-hand side of your screen. Click the request phone icon to bring up the teleconferencing information on the screen. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please call WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3239. This presentation is being recorded. Your first speaker for today is David Smith. He is the Vice President of Marketing and Community at Revolution Analytics. Mr. Smith, you now have the floor. Thank you very much, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be joining us from. Uh, for today's webinar, Building and Deploying Customer Behavior Models. Uh, as you just heard, I'm David Smith, Vice President of Marketing and Community at Revolution Analytics. And it's my great pleasure to be joined today by Paul Macy, who is President and CEO of Lytics. In fact, Paul will be uh, handling the bulk of today's presentation and demonstration uh, in the webinar today. Uh, but I'll spend a few minutes uh, just before we begin to introduce you to Revolution Analytics. Uh, before handing over to Paul, uh, we'll really introduce you to Linux uh, and then jump into the meat of today's presentation talking about the customer behavior lifecycle. And he'll be contrasting the classic approach versus the today's approach as implemented in the Linux IQ system. Uh, there will be a demonstration, so you'll be able to see uh, the Linux system in action. And Paul will follow up with a couple of case studies. And as we mentioned at the outset, we do encourage you to submit questions during the presentation into the Q&A box. Uh, I'll be monitoring your questions as Paul is doing his presentation and answering in real time where I can. And the remaining questions we will respond to in the live Q&A at the end of today's session, which should last around about 45 minutes or so. Uh, but with that, uh, let me kick things off by introducing you to Revolution Analytics. Uh, we are the only provider of commercial big data, big analytics software based on the open source R statistical computing language. And I'll tell you a little bit about R just in a moment in case you're not familiar with it. Uh, but basically, we offer software that provides scalable performance with distributed and parallelized analytics, many of which you'll see implemented behind the scenes of the Linux IQ system in the demo later on. Uh, one of the great features of Revolution R Enterprise, our software, is the ability to write analytics once in the R language and to deploy them into whatever enterprise platform you're using uh, for your predictive analytics systems. And finally, we make it easy to build and deploy applications based on the latest modern analytics, again, as we'll see implemented with Linux IQ. And of course, we can help you use R and build analytical applications uh, with our experts, which can help train you up in the, in the system. Uh, we have quick start programs, which let you get started quickly, as the name suggests, with building analytical applications on our platform. And of course, our experienced customer support team is here to help you throughout the entire process. For anybody who's not familiar with R, it is a, a statistical computing language that has really been exploding over the last four or five years in terms of uh, the, the main language used for building analytical applications. In fact, just some recent news, uh, R uh, was uh, recently announced as the highest paid IT skill in a Dice.com survey that was published just last week. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, the most used data science language 
uh, other than SQL, which everybody is used to interacting with databases. It's used by more than 70% of data miners, and according to the Redmonk analyst firm, is the number 15 language of all programming languages, including things like Java and C++. It's growing faster than any other data science language, and today has more than 2 million users around the world using the R language for implementing statistical models and predictive analytics. We here at Revolution Analytics build on top of R with our product, Revolution R Enterprise. It's the only big data, big analytics platform based on open source R. So if you want to get high performance, scalable analytics with the R, with the R language, it is portable across enterprise platforms. And as I mentioned, makes it easy to build and deploy analytical, analytical applications I encourage you to take a look at Revolution R Enterprise, and you can find information about it on the revolutionanalytics.com website. So with that, uh, let me introduce our, our main speaker today, who is Paul Macy. He is the president and CEO of Lithic. Uh, he's got a PhD in statistics and, and nearly 25 years of experience designing and delivering strategic analytics solutions for predictive modeling and marketing optimization to businesses of all sizes and across all industries. So a great speaker with great background, deep knowledge about marketing optimization, which Paul will be sharing us with today. And I'll hand it over to you, Paul, now. Thank you, Paul. Okay, thanks, David, for the nice introduction. And of course, thanks to everyone out there for joining us today. Uh, so my goal here today is to show you some tools and techniques for rapidly, and, and rapidly is a key word here, rapidly building and deploying customer-focused predictive models. I'm mainly going to do this through a live demonstration using real data, and of course that's always more exciting than uh, you know a bunch of PowerPoints. Um, so most of our time will be spent there, but of course you know I do need to take a few minutes to set things up and walk through uh, a little bit of slide here, um, and we'll take a few polls along the way as well. So first, a quick background on Lithic as a company. Uh, we're a technology and consulting company firmly focused on enabling our clients to do what I'll call advanced analytics or high-powered analytics, so things like predictive modeling and marketing optimization. And our main business area of focus is on the marketing domain, so customer and marketing, CRM, and analytics. Our clients uh, really span uh, quite a few industries, a number of industries in different sizes, and I'm happy to say that a number of our clients on the list here have uh, been joint with Revolution, uh, which really speaks to the strength of our partnership. And uh, I believe that brings us actually to our first poll question. That's right, Paul. Thank you very much. And you should see the poll on your screen now. We're just wondering of those of you in the audience, what analytics platform are you currently using? Uh, for building your analytic models? Uh, is it SAS? Is it SPSS? Is it R or Revolution R Enterprise? Or is it KXEN? Or if you're using some other system or not actually building analytic models at the moment, please choose other. Um, your answers will be re being recorded now. And just while we're waiting for the responses to come in, Paul, I know that you use Revolution R Enterprise as the analytic engine behind Lytics IQ. Can you tell us a little bit about why you chose Revolution R Enterprise for that application? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, like you guys there at Revolution, uh, all clients uh, working with more and bigger data all the time, and so there's always a need to handle bigger and bigger data sets, you know, as people call them nowadays, the, uh, the uh, popular phrase, big data. And so the uh, Revolution R Enterprise really handles that well, and it's really geared towards working with big data. So for us, it was really the only way to bring that uh, to our customer base. Great. Thanks, Paul. And with that, we'll take a look at the results for the audience and see what uh, what the responses were like. And I'm, oh, there we go, they're coming up on my screen now. So it looks like about half the audience poll is, uh, is using either R or Revolution Enterprise for their analytic systems today. Uh, about 27% is using SAS, uh, and about 70 by 17% is using some other system. So with that, I'll turn it back to you. Very good, thanks. <laughs> Okay, so let me start with a quick introduction to kind of get into the meat of the presentation here. Uh, probably actually a review for many of you, uh, but th these are the kind of things that, you know, we're talking about when we say, you know, use a phrase like customer behavior modeling. So, you know, we here at Lytics and Revolution and uh, like many of you out there, look at customer relationship as really a dynamic cycle. It's, it's kind of a constant tug of war 
between the organization and its customers. And uh, so, for example, in the acquisition stage, we're often building models to predict uh, things like who may be profitable if we were to acquire them, or maybe who's most likely to respond to an upcoming direct mail campaign, acquisition campaign that we have. In the growth stage, we're really trying to solidify and expand on the current customer relationships we have. So, you know, here it might tend to, you know, look for the best opportunities to sell additional products or services, you know, so-called cross-sell models, or maybe to uh, try and increase uh, customer loyalty to us. At the same time, we're looking to retain as many of the good customers that we have as possible. So, you know, we're identifying key to retention is issues with things like churn models, which will be the focus of a demonstration that we get to later. Or, you know, worst case scenario, we might be um, looking to win back lapse customers or lost customers and you know, maybe implement something like the win back model. And you layer on top of that the fact that, you know, the models themselves are only a part of the analytic solution uh, because then the marketer has to decide a lot of other things. So, in other words, what's the best strategy for communicating with each individual? You know, what channels, what offers, what message, and, and all of that with the limited budget and limited resources. And, uh, David, I believe that brings us to a second poll. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Paul. <laughs> so we wanted to ask uh, the audience here, which area of customer behavior modeling are you most interested in learning more about? Uh, is it customer acquisition? Is it relationship growth or customer retention? And while the responses are coming in, Paul, I thought I'd ask, you know, from, from your clients, which of these areas seems to be the, of the sort of the highest priority of the most interest? Yeah, it's a good question. Actually, um, probably by maybe by far and away is a little bit strong, but we definitely see a lot of um, interest on, in retention and churn modeling, so understanding uh, what customers are most at risk for retention and understanding uh, what the value, potential value of those customers is down the road so that the market can make some of that trade-off decision. You know, what's the, the risk-reward scenario? How, how likely are they to leave versus how profitable uh, will they be to us if we were able to retain them? Okay, great. So definitely the retention side, a lot on the acquisition side as well. Excellent. So it looks like the poll has closed. We're just waiting for the results to come back in, and uh, we'll see which of those is of, uh, of the most interest to the crowd. Looks like the results are just still coming through here. There we go. And it looks like C, customer retention, uh, was of most interest uh, at 44%. It was actually a pretty even spread. Uh, relationship growth was at 32%, and customer acquisition was still at 24%. So interest across all the areas. And with that, I'll send it back to you, Paul. And that, I'm actually glad to see that because it shows that I wasn't blowing smoke when I said hard customers uh, tend to uh, talk a lot more about customer retention. So uh, Paul's going to throw in the same thing. <clears throat> so based on what I just walked through in terms of you know, the customer life cycle. Clearly, marketers have a lot to worry about. Uh, they have data and customer relationships and budgets and, and so on and so on. Um, so putting a complex layer of technology on top of all of this is pretty daunting. And um, to this point, actually, uh, kind of an external point of view here, Forrest themselves have recently said that uh, technology and the predictive analytics vendors out there need to Kind of recognize this issue and provide, um, you know, might call easier to use tools with more of a business user focus. And we definitely agree with that. Um, in fact, that's really the key focus of our analytics platform that we'll be uh, you know, talking about here in a few minutes. But at the same time, um, I would also say let's, there's no reason why we can't take that opportunity to also focus on the data scientists' needs. Uh, they need to be more efficient as well. So uh, we can kind of accomplish both things, uh, you know, in one fell swoop here. So as a quick comparison, um, I look at the classic approach to modeling is uh, very manual, very coding intensive, very labor intensive. And, and by the way, I can uh, talk about these things. Uh, as David mentioned, I've got a very kind of technical background as well, and I've been in the weeds for, you know, 20 plus years working with clients doing these kind of things. So, you know, lots of code is written tested and it's debugged and it's iterated through many times and you're testing out new data cleaning or different algorithmic approaches. And uh, even on the back end at implementation time, uh, you know, it often requires recoding model output maybe into a different environment. And, and so there's more testing and more debugging. 
And the approach then that our platform Linux IT takes, and what we're going to be kind of focusing a bit here uh, today, is that much of that iterative manual process can really be made much more automated and intelligent. Um, so, you know, the interface into the models uh, can be focused on the business language, but at the same time provide all the options that an advanced user can, you know, cares about and take advantage of. Uh, much of the iterative testing and running that can be done uh, can be done through manual backend processing um, supported in our platform, as I mentioned before, through connectivity uh, to Revolution Enterprise. On the results side of things, you know, from my point of view, there doesn't need to be any reason to code up performance metrics and write the code behind list charts. Let's just uh, pre-compute all the relevant ones and make them easily available for comparison to either a data scientist or a business user. And then when we're ready to implement, um, in other words, from a modeler's perspective, score the model, then let's keep it easy, consistent, and without kind of adding another layer of coding on top. So that's really the uh, overview to the approach we're going to take. And it certainly appears to be, as you know, a lot of the words that I'm using here, kind of geared towards ease of use um, versus sort of a hardcore data scientist. And, and so, you know, what about us? What about people like myself? Yeah, I, I am a data scientist. I'm a you know, geeky statistician, data scientist at heart, been doing this kind of stuff for a long time. So I, I personally could be annoyed at this new approach, but um, here's what I say about that. We can, we can better use our skills. And we now I'm talking about, you know, myself, a data scientist, better use our skills and training on higher value parts of the solution. So let's focus on things like uh, data and data design, data collection, the analytics and the modeling strategies uh, that we can give to marketers and proving the value of advanced analytics uh, to the overall business or building business cases for analytics. Um, you know, I, I kind of say we're selling ourselves short to spend 80% of our time hacking out code and, you know, cutting and pasting and debugging uh, those sorts of things. And, and and that said, you know, most of us would say that we're happy to do those things. You know, we, we've been doing that for a long time. And it's, it's you know, it, if we're able to still be powerful and flexible and get strong models, um, if that were the only way to do it, to hack out code, that'd be great. But it doesn't have to be the only way to, to uh, get great models. So we're going to jump into the demo here in just one second. Uh, what you're going to see is a cloud-based uh, hosted platform for advanced analytics called Lytics IQ. There are four integrated solutions for managing data, developing insights, and doing things like predictive modeling and, and marketing optimization. Um, what we're going to uh, focus on here today is the Predict IQ uh, solution within the platform. And of course, as mentioned before, it's powered in part by uh, Revolution Analytics Enterprise. So the uh, demonstration I'm gonna walk you through this is a, a quick background, it is going to be uh, kind of focused on the retail industry. It'll be a churn-oriented uh, problem and specifically um, in the apparel industry. So let me take just two seconds here to share my browser window with the audience. And if all went well, you will now see a uh, Firefox browser, and I'm in the uh, Linux IQ platform. And first thing I wanted to do here, and, and again, the, the focus of today's conversation is not on sort of all the data management aspects, um, much more on the kind of efficient use of tools like Predict IQ to do uh, predictive modeling. But at the very least, I do want to orient you a little bit to the data set that we have here. So again, retail industry, apparel uh, specifically, and the data set that we have access to um, and that we'll uh, use for modeling is customer level uh, data. And uh, we have uh, quite a few pieces of information in here. So the kinds of things in here would be uh, demographics and geodemographics. Uh, we have a lot of transactional information about you know, the kinds of brands and dollars spent on different brands uh, for each individual. Demographics such as their gender, uh, recency kind of metrics, so last and um, second to last uh, purchase dates and days since purchase and uh, those sorts of uh, pieces of information, all aggregated, of course, from uh, raw source systems. And um, in particular, the very last field, as I scroll to the right here, is a field called lapse flag. 
and um, can kind of use that as a backdrop to uh, what we're going to uh, walk through on the modeling side. So it is a churn model, and the way that we've defined lapse with this client data, so uh, we define a per person as having lapsed if they haven't uh, spent any, uh, they haven't uh, shopped with us, spent any money or purchased any items in the last 150 days. Okay, so those people are flagged in here as a one, and if they have purchased more recently than that, they're a zero. And of course, it's a historical data set, and what we're looking to do here is build a model that tries to tie together or correlate that lapse or non lapse action, that customer behavior of not purchasing anymore with some of the information we have about that customer. Again, purchase history, transactional history, demographics, geo demographics, and so on. So with that backdrop, again, I'm going to uh, jump into our predict IQ uh, part of the platform and spend uh, most, if not all, the rest of our time here. Um, I want to orient you, uh, you know, a little bit to the modeling lifecycle and, and how models are built and, and tested and validated and, and reviewed here. Uh, but actually, first thing I want to do before even getting there is, um, and, and by the way, I'll, I'll back up one second. As I walk through this, I'm going to kind of do it with two points of view in mind and kind of following up on the theme of the PowerPoint part of the webinar here. You know, we talked about two, two ways to look at things. One is from the business perspective, the marketing person's perspective, you know, that, that business user uh, way of viewing building models and doing analytics. And the second is more the data scientist view of things. It's the, the techie, the modeler, the statistician, um, and I'm going to kind of play the role of both people as we go through here and kind of see where both can benefit from a uh, platform like this. So first, um, creating a new model here, um, if we were to start from scratch, uh, building a model here in the Lytics IQ platform, the way we really think about it is coming at it from the business perspective, the business language perspective. So, um, you know, a marketer is more likely to know whether they need a churn model or a response model or a customer value model to support some uh, upcoming programs that they have versus thinking about it from the algorithmic perspective. You know, a data scientist comes at it from the perspective of, you know, I, I need to build a logistic regression model or a neural network, I need to look at shade. Uh, but the marker is kind of coming at it from a different uh, point of view. And so creating a new model in the, in the platform, we've really got that business language behind it. But again, doesn't leave the data scientist out of things, doesn't uh, leave the, the geek like myself um, unable to do anything interesting. We'll show that here in a second. So with that in mind, um, in the platform here, it becomes very easy to organize one, two, or dozens of models so I can uh, organize them into model libraries and maybe have a different library for different kinds of models like churn models and value models and maybe cross affinity models. And in particular, I'm going to focus on, in this particular library, we have uh, two models uh, currently there. And I'm going to click on this one that's called predict 150-day lapse and use that uh, pre-created model as a backdrop for walking you through the process here. And really, um, again, we try and walk the user through the, the process um, in the, uh, the, the typical model building cycle. And so, you know, first thing uh, that we'll often need to do is set up the model. What are the settings and options and, and other things that define how this thing is going to run? And uh, that, that's what I'll click here in a second, and I'll kind of walk through how that works in, in Linux IQ to make things easy for you. The uh, second thing, of course, is we need to run the model. Then we want to look at how it went, what are some of the performance metrics and performance analysis that, that comes out of running that model. And then we start moving towards the implementation stage. It may need to go through an approval process and the final implementation process. So before I get there, let me uh, come back and let's look at how uh, models are uh, kind of defined here in the platform. Again, two different perspectives. First perspective is that the business user, the non-technical person who wants to build a model to support some upcoming marketing program, but you know they they don't have the, the technical skills and background, and you know we're trying to make it very uh, quick and easy for them to build very good, accurate models. And uh, from that person's perspective, there's only a few things that need to be done, and, and uh, this this first tab here is really all they need to uh, pay attention to. You know, certainly pick a data set that uh, they have access to here in the platform, and so uh, what's selected here is the one that we were looking at back in the uh, data manager. So the uh, summary data view of our customers. Um, find a field that's in that data set that represents, in this case, the churn 
behavior that we're uh, looking to model, and in this case, that's called the last flag. Um, I only see here fields that make sense to be used in the Turing model. Um, uh, so, for example, binary fields. And uh, last real thing then is of all the other uh, variables in my data set, excuse me here, um, let me select the ones that I want to use as potential predictors in the model. And again, there isn't really a, a limit here. There's a lot of intelligence behind the scenes. So again, as a marketer, I can say, you know, just, just uh, you know, let's, let's pick a, a wide set of variables and let the platform determine which ones have a uh, the high correlation as predictive of this lap that we're trying to predict. So it's really a selection of the candidate predictive variables, and the uh, the platform has the intelligence in the back end to do simple things like removing fields that are just unique identifiers or by accident we pick the, uh, the uh, dependent variable field itself, it removes that, but also goes a lot further, of course, in doing intelligent uh, variable selection. So again, from the marketer's standpoint, from the business person's standpoint, that's all they really need to do. All the other settings and parameters and options are set to very intelligent default values and um, you can get very, very good, strong models um, even with just doing that, but now I'm going to put on my kind of geek hat, my data scientist hat, and say, you know, what else is it there to play with if I want to kind of fine tune uh, a number of things and, and get a little more technical. So I'm not going to spend, uh, you know, a ton of time on all these, but just kind of show you um, how we can mix, you know, the, uh, the business user view of things with the, the data scientist view of things. So you can play around with different uh, sampling approaches for um, data that's used. Uh, from the original data set to build the model. We can um, change the default way that the model was validated from a default Howell out to you know, any other approach that we might want to take like cost validation or back test. Again, this is something that you know, a marketer or a business person might not even know that this is something that should happen, but in the platform it happens automatically. But the advanced user can come in here and specify uh, different details behind how that how the sample validation occurs. Uh, very interestingly, um, for the data scientists, on the algorithms and settings tab, I can essentially here set up a bake-off that compares and runs, you know, one, two, three, or dozens of algorithms um, and, uh, and runs them all through and compares them to each other and spits out all the kind of bake-off performance comparisons uh, on the backside. So in this case, I have two algorithms on the list which can run uh, both a logistic regression and a trade. And I can, uh, of course, go in here and play around with some more detailed settings behind those things. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, some of the intelligence that's in the platform that e even a uh, you know, business person, but even a data scientist would be very happy about in terms of the efficiency of, of the way they usually work. And that is certain aspects of, of uh, creating data and cleaning data and preparing data for modeling is very iterative and it you know has to do with you know what's the right way to to bin categorical fields or should I normalize in those fields or, you know how do I handle missing values and things like that and um, again the platform here is taking the approach that uh, we can be very intelligent include uh, intelligent processing on the back end on the front end let's just allow the user to say um, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and try binning categorical predictors and do it in the most intelligent way. Or maybe I don't want to bin them. Or maybe I wanted to do both and try, try them both out, both, both ways, and see which one works best, kind of giving all the, uh, the metrics on the back end for both possibilities. So a lot of that intelligence behind the data prep and setup is also kind of built in here. So uh, that 80% of time that we usually spend on data, data prep and binning and normalization and cleaning up missing values, all, you know, a, a good chunk of that is um, handled here in a very intelligent way. Um, of course, uh, many advanced settings, key values and thresholds are available uh, to the user as well. Um, as I said, what we can do here in, in sort of very easy point and click bake off fashion is I can add any number of algorithms to this list. So if I care about these things, I can, you know, throw in a neural network or naive Bayes or support vector machine, the kind of algorithms that make sense for this kind of model are, are listed here. And in fact, I can add the same algorithm multiple times. I want to try it with different settings and different parameters and different options. So I can create, and, and we, we and our clients have created bake-offs with you know, dozens of, uh, we call them iterations uh, along the way. So let me move forward here. Um, filtering, very easy to, uh, to handle once 
build uh, model some set can handle uh, missing values with a number of options and uh, we can also handle um, how uh, the result how the iterations and the algorithms are processed and what the user gets back from that in uh, particular I have it set for this uh, this model as uh, build all models for review and so what that's going to do is all the algorithms this big bake off that I in this case was a small bake off the bake off that I set up um, will turn through all the performance metrics, all the uh, holdout sample performance metrics for those algorithms, but also spit back to me uh, more details uh, from those uh, final model builds. So what are the, you know, give me the widgets regression coefficients, give me the, uh, the resulting tree. So with that in mind, uh, the next step, of course, so again, we're kind of stimulating the process of walking through a model build. Uh, next step might be that we're going to execute the model and, and what I'll actually do is um, kind of execute this in real time and uh, while we're talking a bit more I'll uh, kind of open the console window down here and we'll um, see that model uh, progress through as we talk. Um, one of the things I wanted to introduce you to and, and again tying into this idea that we really want to make things as kind of easy and simple as possible and intelligent and automated as possible to build models and implement models. And so one of the options that uh, we have access to here in the platform for, uh, for building and executing models is to put them on a schedule. And not just sort of the, the usual date-based schedule, you know, you know, run it Saturday overnight, but uh, we can put models and uh, almost everything in the platform on the schedule called upon data refresh. And one of the um, very intensive and, and difficult complex tasks I've dealt with with my clients over the years is when I want to refresh a model, it, it's never as easy as it seems because the last time the model was built might have been a year ago and that person's gone and all the documentation is sitting in a drawer somewhere and uh, we don't know where they got the data from and how they define the SQL queries, et cetera, et cetera. So we try make that refresh process very easy here and, and what we can do is say upon data refresh and what that will do is once the data that is behind the model changes okay we look at the data source and see if there's an update or a refresh of that data once it changes it kicks off kind of automatically a new uh, run of that model um, I can get a no notification when it happens when it finishes and come in and review the results manually if I want to uh, so we can see the uh, model is plugging uh, along down here and uh, um, while that's uh, happening, I'm going to kind of move through the next stage of our uh, modeling process, and that is the evaluation stage. So, model has uh, been defined, it's been executed, and uh, by the way, you notice that there's also sort of a complete model management component here. Every time I build and refresh a, a new version of the model, it tracks those versions over time, and I can always go backwards in time to look at results from uh, prior uh, runs of the model. So none of that stuff is, is lost. It's the complete history of everything we've done from model building and uh, results perspective is, is stored and, uh, and uh, always available to us. Um, what I was saying in the uh, PowerPoint section about looking at uh, you know, results and analysis, it should be so much easier. I shouldn't need to code anything up. I should get uh, you know, quick analysis performance metrics. And, and again, we can do that uh, here in the platform very easily. So, for example, if I want to uh, maybe take a look at uh, a number of list metrics that result from this model build, I come down here and pick those metrics from the list. And, and um, it, it, you remember we have two iterations of two algorithms that are being compared here. And so I get a kind of quick chart. No coding, no programming involved, and uh, but a, a very nice and easy to understand comparison in terms of these list metrics um, of these uh, two iterations of algorithms that we ran. Of course, everything, if I uh, wish, can be exported back to my machine in terms of these charts and tables uh, to put into a PowerPoint, show to my boss, or show to my client. Um, things like list charts, as I mentioned, very easy. So uh, I'm going to do a list chart, select list from the the um, drop down there and I uh, get a, a nice list chart comparison of my two algorithms. Certainly looks like that second one, the shade is uh, looking a little bit better than my just regression just in terms of overall list uh, across all deciles. Um, all this is also uh, downloadable and I uh, can get quite a bit more detail by looking at it in a tabular form at the level of percentile um, as opposed to just deciles. 
And um, in addition to that, again, moving on to more of the data scientists view of things, um, if we were interested in, in coefficients behind regression style models or what kind of binning uh, was done behind the scenes or the tree itself, if I had run some tree models, I can get access to all of that here as well. So um, again, moving in the, along the uh, process here, um, we built the model, uh, we find the model, built the model, and by the way, you can see in the meantime that, that last uh, refresh has uh, completed behind the scenes here. Um, next stage might be a prep for um, implementing the model. And again, this is often a tug of war and a, a little bit of a, a complex um, iterative task in kind of in the, uh, the classic world. Um, what we're doing here is allowing first of all for an approval process. And, and now this is just a demo model, um, demo environment, so there are no uh, servers, but we can set up others um, who uh, we may want, like our boss or a client, to approve a model before it's implemented. And uh, when we are ready to implement, we can come in here and, and pick which version, which iteration of the model we want to implement, and implement meaning put into production or allow scrolling out to run off of. Um, request approval for that, and then anyone who's set up to approve the model would uh, get an email and, and come in here and physically review and, and approve it before it could go into production. So at this point in time, we are at uh, development version 2.8 of our uh, last model, um, the production version 2.5.2, so the second iteration of version 2.5 of the model. And the uh, question would be, all right, how do we, you know, for the model, sort of the next uh, and last process was that the actual implementation and the idea of making that easier too and not requiring a recode or exporting things out to other systems. Um, so again, the idea here is to make that as uh, easy as possible. And um, in, in our world within the uh, IT platform, we call that a scoring job. And I can uh, Define, create scoring jobs that are associated with any model that I have in production system. And again, it's a very easy process. The uh, scoring job is defined uh, simply by picking which model I um, am looking to score, uh, telling what data set I want to, uh, to run through that model. And these are the data sets that I have user have access um, in the platform. Um, Scores are stored in what we call scoring catalogs. They're really just big data sets that are keyed by something like a customer ID, whatever the user chooses. And then uh, stored in that catalog are the scores from any number of models associated with, with uh, at the customer level. So I can have in the same catalog churn model scores and cross sell scores and affinity scores and response model scores all, all together in one place. And they're also version controlled as well. So when I rescore a model, it doesn't necessarily overwrite prior scores of that model. It just depends on the scoring catalog. So I can always look back and see how a model, a, a, an individual score or decile is progressing over time. So I can assign as well um, deciles, percentiles, quintiles, uh, whatever I want to that score. So that is the, um, the, the, the very simple process of setting up a scoring job nothing more to it really other than to come here and run it. So I will um, also run this as, as we watch it in real time. Um, notice I will say just for the sake of being uh, clear here that for the sake of this demonstration, the data that I've run through the scoring job is the same data set that I was partially used to build the model. So it's not sort of a pure example of a production environment, but, but uh, you know, still worthy of, um, of discussion. So as that runs through, I'll also mention a scoring job can be put on that same um, kind of upon data refresh schedule. And maybe this is even more important or interesting than saying a model can be put on that schedule. The scoring job might be something that you're rerunning, maybe refreshing um, customer data, behavioral data every, every week or every month, or maybe it's every day, every night. And um, by putting it on that schedule, you can set things up to automatically find and, and see that you have fresh customer data or new prospect data, run that scoring job, and then uh, spit the new results back into the scoring catalog. And um, that catalog itself can be uh, set up to automatically export out to an external system, such as an FTP site or some other place where you're 
uh, marketing or CRM systems uh, can pick up those scores and append them into your campaign uh, uh, analysis. Okay, so the uh, scoring job is complete. Um, if I want to kind of manually look at the scores and come over here into my scoring catalogs, uh, the catalog that we're using here was called the customer level model scores. So I can come in here and again, this is sort of a, a more manual way to just review how things went and make sure they worked well. I can, um, in my catalog right now, I have a couple of different model scores stored in here. So I have a, a, a 12 month value model as well as a 150 day lapse model. Scores from those models are stored in the catalog. So let me pick this one that we just uh, looked at. And of course, as I said, all versions of the scores from those models are stored over time. So let me pick the uh, this uh, version that we just ran here. And I can come in here and I see it's used in this case by uh, what's called consumer ID. And I can easily uh, sort by score or by decile if I want to and export, again, in more manual fashion, export this it's a smaller data set out to Excel, um, out to a CSV file. But in a more automated fashion, as I said, uh, the scoring catalog is really just another data set that sits back in the uh, data manager here in Lidus IQ, and I can set that up for automatic export once it changes. And so that kind of completes the uh, automatic cycle here of bringing data automatically into the scoring process, job runs automatically, Results go into a catalog, and that catalog is, uh, is exported once it's complete. So, what I've hoped I've shown you here is a, a, a kind of a complete process focused on modeling that um, has a little bit of a you know being geared towards the business user and kind of ease of use and uh, you know lack of coding, point and click interface, but also has a lot of those nice, nice uh, little uh, tools and things that the uh, data scientists like myself can play around with. So with that, I'm going to um, come back into the PowerPoint. And um, David, I believe that leads us to a third poll question. This might be a good time to take a little bit of a pause and uh, go back to the audience because you know, Paul just showed how in that the interface there's a view from the point of view of the data scientist and a view from the point of view of the business analyst. So we we're wondering that from the point of view of our audience, what do you consider your expertise to be? Is it as a hardcore data scientist or a big data guru, a scientific programmer or coder, a business analyst or a consultant or marketing or business or IT? And Paul, you know, I was just wondering from, from your point of view, um, you know, what kind of users do you feel like this application is best fitted to? Uh, yeah, and you can probably take um, from my discussion, my focus today, that, uh, you know, we kind of feel like it has uh, both points of view. Um, the original impetus behind it really, though, was to help the business user, the non-technical person, do these things like um, advanced analytics, modeling, optimization, without having to you know, learn how to be a scientific program or be a data scientist or go get a PhD in statistics. So that was really the, the impetus. But, um, you know, hopefully we've shown that there's a, uh, you know, an audience out there that's in that data scientist community that can be, uh, take advantage of what's provided here and, as I alluded to before, make them more efficient in, in their day-to-day -day work. Okay, great. And it looks like the poll results are just coming in now. But in terms of the audience that we have, uh, online today, uh, it seems like the uh, the most frequent response, uh, I'm still waiting for it to come through here. Here we go. The most frequent response is the hardcore data scientist community, uh, but also well represented uh, in the audience is the scientific programmer slash coder uh, and the business analyst. Um, so a good mix of people again on the audience. Um, so let me turn it back over to you, Paul, to, to wrap us up with a case study. Yeah, I will uh, wrap it up. And I was going to say one uh, kind of quick thing about this poll here. What's interesting is uh, a poll like this probably really should have check boxes instead of the uh, radio buttons because I, I would imagine there are a lot of people out there, including myself, who check off two or three or, or a bunch of those things. So that's, um, yeah, I, I, it'd be really interesting to see what kind of cross category people put themselves yeah. in at some point as well. Yeah, good point. A couple of our audience members made the same point as well. Great. Um, okay, so last uh, 
some slide here, and then we're going to turn it over to Q and A. Is I want to come back to another case study as well. So the demo again meant to kind of walk you through an actual process of using a platform like this to build models and build them very quickly, and, and not only build but test and validate and implement. And we did all that in you know, 15, uh, 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, I wanted to expand that idea and uh, uh, kind of walk you quickly through a case study um, of a client of ours who's a uh, large nonprofit organization who um, had a series of affinity models, you might also think of them as cross-sell models, and um, series meaning a couple dozen eventually expanding into over three dozen of, of these models. And what we were able to do and, and help, uh, you, you can imagine that that's a big onerous process if you were to think about things in the classic approach, right? All of those models kind of go into the, the data and the algorithm selection, the test and comparison, variable selection, and, you know, and implementation, the whole process uh, can be very onerous for one model or two models, much less, you know, 24 to 40 models. And so um, we um, kind of helped them bring that process into Lytics IQ and we're able to kind of bring that cycle down from uh, multiple months, three or four months, to a couple of weeks. And the really kind of important thing, and I didn't really say this before, only alluded to it, is if what we lost from being more efficient and, and you know, being able to get our models to market faster and more quickly is that the models weren't as good, then we could talk about the trade-offs, right? You know, are willing to lose model accuracy to be able to get a model out, you know, a week or, you know, maybe a month faster. Um, the nice thing is about all the uh, tests that we've done with our platform here, including this being an example of that, um, we, we don't lose that. The intelligence that's built into the platform is kind of goes right alongside of the efficiency that we gain in, in um, going through that modeling process. And in fact, in this case, we measured very specifically that the models uh, built very quickly in Lytics IQ were 5% better than the ones that took, you know, three to four months for a manual effort. So eventually that was expanded to a series of 40 models and all built in or run and managed within the Lytics IQ platform. So as a uh, kind of quick ending here, um, information for uh, contacting us is uh, on your screen there, uh, myself, as well as our uh, director of sales, Art Warren, our email addresses are there. And also wanted to uh, note that uh, we have a uh, virtual course that I will we'll be leading uh, along with Revolution coming up uh, called Customer Analytics for Marketers uh, towards the end of April. We'll be over four um, half-day sessions. So it's uh, essentially a two-day course spread over four half-day sessions. And uh, you can see registration link and a uh, coupon code for those who are in the webinar uh, to take advantage of that. Very good. Thank you very much, Paul, for uh, for a great presentation and a, and a great demonstration. Uh, I can see already from the questions that are coming in a lot of interest out there uh, in customer analytics uh, from the audience. Uh, for everybody who's on the call, if you would like to ask a question of Paul, uh, please enter your question into the Q&A box and hit enter. Um, but I've got some questions already, um, so let's jump right in. I think the first question uh, comes here from Paul. And he asks, uh, is what you've been demonstrating here today, is that part of the revolution analytics tool, revolution or enterprise, or is that something that uh, Lytics specifically offers? Yes, and uh, the answer is it's on the, the latter side. So it is a, a tool that is offered by uh, Lytics as a hosted platform. Uh, but to be very clear, as, as I say it a couple times, it sits on top of revolution analytics as a modeling engine. So kind of go hand in hand, but the interface itself is, is, is the Lytics IQ platform. Great, thanks Paul. Uh, I've got another question here from Sarah uh, who asks, can you use the model outputs in the system as part of a marketing optimization plan? Uh, yeah, actually, um, that's a good question. So the, um, the I, I, and I, I really just lost over the fact that we have another solution in the platform called Optimize IQ, which helps marketers very easily do constrained optimization to optimize things like channel optimization, cross-channel optimization, and uh, you know online advertising optimization or direct mail budget optimization. Um, so the nice consistent thing is that the scores that come out of um, these models, like from the scoring jobs, 
can be, as I said before, they kind of get pushed into a scoring catalog, and that's a data set within the Lytics IQ platform. So the, the really nice thing about the way these things are connected is that those scores can be uh, brought as inputs into an optimization scenario. Um, so in other words, uh, response model scores and customer value scores, insurance scores, can all be sort of brought into the same optimization problem and used as like trading off against each other. So in other words, you know, am I more optimal to go up a higher response rate, lower value person, or a you know, lower response rate, higher value person, and what's the right message and offer to give to those missing people? So very much so, um, scores from modeling can be pushed into marketing optimization. Okay, and if people in the audience are interested in those other modules from Linux IQ, they can just contact you directly? Sorry, David, I, I missed that. Yeah, if uh, people have questions about the other components of Linux IQ we didn't get to cover today, um, is it best for them just to email you directly? Yes, uh, email myself or Art Warren, and I will also say I, I think the uh, PowerPoint is still on the screen there. There is uh, one slide for each of those solutions in the deck, and um, that I assume will be available to the, uh, to the individuals out there as well. That's right. Yeah, for everybody who's on the call today, you will receive a copy of the slide and a replay uh, in a follow-up email within the next 48 hours. In the meantime, we've got time for, um, for quite a few more questions. Uh, let's take the next one from Stephen. Um, Paul, when you were doing the demo earlier on, you did mention at one point um, categorical variable binning. Uh, could you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, categorical variable, um, would, you know, example, of course, things like uh, state that someone lives in, uh, we thought of as a categorical variable. And so when we say categorical variable binning, what we're talking about is intelligent ways to take those 50 or 51 or 52 states that you see in Puerto Rico, for example, take those uh, 51, 50, 52 categories and uh, combine them together in an intelligent way. So, and do that with the um, kind of response variable in mind. So do, uh, for example, the states kind of cluster in regions or maybe they don't and they kind of cluster based on geographics or, uh, you know, the demographics of a state or population densities of the state and things like that. So it's really a, a way to take multiple categories and reduce them down intelligently to a smaller number of categories. And a reason, just to kind of back it up a little bit, a reason for doing that is that a lot of processing and, and algorithmic work is made more efficient with fewer consolidated categories versus, you know, 50 or 52 in the state. Okay, great. And um, here's another question from Sean, which actually goes back to the scoring discussion we were having earlier. You know, so once you've actually built the model and generated the scores, uh, well, actually, can you automate that scoring process with PMML? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. And actually, uh, the answer to that right now is no within the Lytics IQ platform. Um, it's automated through the process that I walk through in terms of scoring jobs and, and scoring catalogs. Um, however, uh, we have had uh, that question come up before, and uh, there will be a point in time probably in our 3.x series where we implement uh, for some, if not most, model types the ability to have a PMML export so that you could uh, import that into uh, the external system. Okay. And if the user wanted to do that themselves in the meantime, uh, Jim actually asks if, if the platform is user extensible, like, you know, can you plug in your favorite R package or your own R code into the back end of the application to control how it works? Yeah, again, that's a good question at this point, but uh, the answer is no, but we are working on making that, uh, because again, it's something we've heard from a, a number of uh, users out there. We are working, again, probably in our 3X series that's uh, coming out um, starting the end of this quarter, early next quarter. Um, to make that more extensible. So users can plug in R code that might be their favorite algorithm and, and have that show up, uh, for example, on the algorithms list uh, beyond the ones that we provide. Okay. And here's, an, here's another technical question coming from Hassan, uh, who asks, you know, what server-side programming language are you using and how you're connecting into R on the back end? You know, can you just uh, elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so um, there are a lot of kind of tools, I, I guess you'd say, and, and programming structures that um, kind of bring this whole platform together, including, uh, you know, we're using server-side, uh, client-side JavaScript and server-side uh, tools like PHP. 
and um, of course uh, tools like Revolution Enterprise on the uh, the modeling side of things. But it, it's a a combination of quite a few tools in the back end. Okay. Thanks. Uh, here's another question from Michael, kind of about the user interface. Uh, he wants to know if there's any way to give different people permissions to do different tasks within the platform. Yeah, and, and the answer is yes. Um, actually, you may have noticed when I was giving the demonstration, there was an area on the uh, left side of a menu that was collapsed uh, for administration, administration tools. So actually, almost every click that a user can make inside of the platform can be set up with special permissions. So you can set it up so that a, uh, you know, a certain user or a certain group of users um, can build models and another group is for, uh, you know, can be uh, model approvers and some people can build charts and dashboards and the inside IT tool and other people can, can only view them. So uh, yes, there's really a complete kind of administration capability to uh, handle permissions and access to different uh, libraries and data sets as well. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, looks like we've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, let me take uh, one from Jim, who's asking about uh, reporting, and specifically if there's any built-in sort of model performance report generation uh, available in the system, you know, like, for example, using ICHDRNR or something like that. Well, the, uh, yes, I guess there's, um, I certainly would have to say yes, there's model performance report generation um, in terms of the, the kinds of things that I showed you. So um, you know, quite a few metrics that come back from models, so whether it's lift metrics or things like sensitivity and specificity, those kind of metrics, or if it's a quantitative uh, numeric model, things like sum of squared errors and R squared value and other uh, fun sorts of things uh, come back automatically from the running of the uh, algorithms and as I showed, reported back to the user in tabular format or in chart format. Um, so, th so that's how uh, they're generated for the user. Um, to connect that up to uh, sort of live in market performance reporting, that's actually fairly easy to do as well and uh, we can set up and have set up with our clients uh, dashboards that um, you know, take live uh, results from in-market campaigns, tie that back into death files that were associated with each uh, individual prospect in the campaign, and then report sort of model performance, you know, death file over death file response rates uh, from the live campaign. Oh, great. So you can actually see the performance, you know, results of campaigns as they run? Absolutely, yeah. That's awesome. All right. So let's take um, our last question uh, from Stephen. Uh, who asked, um, why did you set the sampling uh, in the demo to estimate a model from just 25,000 rows? Uh, because, you know, the underlying revolution in our enterprise engine, you know, that'll run fine on tens of millions of rows. Yeah, uh, and that's, of course, true. Uh, for the sake of demonstration, though, and to ensure things actually run relatively quickly in the few minutes that I had, um, I, I, I made that restriction. Uh, but there's no technical uh, limit necessarily on uh, having to have done that but purely for right. demonstration purposes. Okay, so if you want to run on campaigns with tens of millions, hundreds of millions of rows, no problem there. That's right. Great, awesome. Well, thank you very much to the audience uh, for all of your questions. It's been some great discussion. Uh, I'd also like to um, thank Paul uh, for his presentation today and the demonstration. Just a reminder to everybody who is on the call that um, you will receive uh, a copy of the slides. Uh, and a link to the replay um, from today's webinar in your email uh, in just a uh, couple of days. And the webinar will also be available for live viewing online uh, at the same time. And you get a link to that uh, in your email as well. So thanks once again for everyone who attending. Do keep an eye at revolutionanalytics.com for all of our upcoming events and training, include the customer analytics for marketers training, uh, which you can see at the link on your screen now. And with that, I'll say goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Take care.